Hey Nard, these folks here uh, have some f a friend going to the Philippines. Why don't you tell them your story? Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Nard Pugyo. I'm from the Philippines, and I met Jesus Christ as a result of Bible translation work. For me, it all started uh, with the Word of God, where it says, uh, for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are laid bare to him with whom we have to do. That's the Word of God, and we in Wycliffe believe that the Bible is God's message for all people everywhere, and there's no exception. And then in Matthew 24, 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end shall come. Man, it's exciting to know that the word of God can be available to every people in there. But for us, among the East Nugs in there, northern part of the Philippines where I come from, we never heard about God. In fact, I could still remember to this day, sitting inside that little tiny hut, watching a little old woman approaching a little tiny hut, watching through the bamboo cracks. She was coming to our hut because my little sister was very, very sick and to the point of death. And this little old woman happened to be the doctor in the village. Well, it's not the medical doctor that you would think of, but the witch doctor that could communicate to the spirit world. And as he was approaching a little tiny hut in there, I could still remember, scared to death because I knew what he was going to do. She was going to come to our hut to make sure that the spirits would a peace, I mean, be a peace somehow to make sure that my little sister was going to live. She climbed up to the bamboo stairs. She got inside the little hut. She walked up towards my little sister lying down on the bamboo floor. Then she took her rolled up mat and she unrolled it beside my little sister lying down on the bamboo floor. And then she knelt down and she took her pouch. She took four very special leaves she picked from a tree nearby. And the leaves, you know, she formed them in a clover leaf like she held the stems, she closed her eyes, and she mumbled something in a language I could not understand. And the leaves, she tossed them up in the air, and the leaves come fluttering down on the floor mat, and she was supposed to decipher what the spirits had demanded that very moment. Whether they would kill my little sister, demand a form of sacrifice, or provide some kind of a medication. But you all know that spirits are real, right? Because the Bible talks about that. That Jesus in his day, he cast out demons. He cast them out to the pigs. Remember the story of the pigs? He cast the demons to the pigs. The pigs come careening down the hillside. And they drown. And then the Bible again says in Ephesians that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in the heavenly host. But we don't have to be scared of them because the Bible again says that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. So we're more than conquerors, so we don't have to be scared of that. But did you know that spirits always demand a form of sacrifice? You know, for us in the jungles, they demanded our pigs, our chickens, our dogs, our cows. Plus, they demanded our total allegiance to them. But you know, all I could remember in that was that my little sister died. But I could still visualize it to this day. My father with a hammer, hammering the little box where my little sister lay down. And I knew then that at the age of three or four, there was life and death. I don't know about you all, but you know, for me, the older I get, the more I marvel at the awesomeness of God. One of those years I'll never forget was 1949. In 1949, there was a young man by the name of G. Richard Rowe from Ira, Vermont, where he said there were more cows than people. He came down from Ira, Vermont, down to Schoon Lake to attend Word of Life Camp International. And right there at the camp at Word of Life in there, Jack Wurtson, the founder of Word of Life International, was preaching at that camp in there. I don't know what he preached that day, but all I knew was that he was preaching the mandate of Jesus Christ in missions. And the invitation was given, and Dick Rowe was one of the first ones to get up out of the seat, walk that aisle, giving his heart to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to serve him in missions. And when I think about that, I said, God, how awesome it is in that while you were still forming me inside my mother's womb, you were already speaking to the heart of the person who would come and introduce me to the person of Jesus Christ. To me, that's awesome grace. Why on earth, the creator of heaven and earth, why would he care about us? Why would he love us? Why would he love us that much? But you know, that's his awesome grace. 
And did you know that right this very instant, God is forming in secret in the mother's womb. The person that is one of you will have to go and introduce to the person of Jesus Christ. Maybe he's right here in our midst. Maybe he's in your church. Maybe he's in your school. Maybe he's in your office. Or maybe he's 15,000 miles away in some jungle around the world. But you alone will be the one that God is going to call to go make sure that person will know about Jesus Christ. The one that's being formed right this second. Dick Rowe know that in the world there were 6,000 some languages existed and 3,000 of them did not have the word of God. And his heart and passion for God was the word of God in the heart language. He wanted to have a part in that, but he couldn't just go at age 18, just out of high school. So he had to go and get educated. So he went on to Wheaton College and he majored in anthropology and he graduated in 1953. 1953 was another special event for me because Dick Rowe joined Wycliffe and Cameron Townsend was down in Mexico doing Bible translation, translation work. He was the founder of Wycliffe Bible Translators. And he was down there and he received a letter from the president of the Philippines, Ramon Magsaysay. And he said to him, Mr. Townsend, I understand you do linguistic research and Bible translation work. Would you please come to our country, the Philippines, because we have over 100 languages in the Philippines that have never been written before. So if you'd come there and do linguistic research, and Bible translation work would really appreciate it. Of course, Mr. Townsend's heart and passion for God was the word of God in the heart language. He couldn't let that go, so he sent out one of his men that was doing translation work in Mexico by the name of Richard Pittman. So he went to the Philippines, and the contract with the Philippine government was signed February 28, 1953, and Bible translation was getting closer and closer into my village, the Isnag people. Dick Rowe joined Wycliffe, he raised his support, he moved from Ira, Vermont to Brewer, Maine, and then January 10, he was gonna be boarding a freighter out of San Francisco. When he got to San Francisco, I always liked to picture Dick Rowe in San Francisco because in 1956, he was gonna be boarding the freighter January 10. But maybe he was walking the streets of San Francisco and all of a sudden he picks up Time Life magazine and in bold headlines it says, Five missionaries were murdered by Alka Indians in Ecuador, South America. I mean, I've always thought Dick Rowe could have said, forget it, God, look at this, God, look at this. Cyber just killed missionaries. I don't want to go to the Philippines. I don't want to go. I want to go back to Maine. I'll teach at university, whatever it takes. But you know he could have done that. He had every right to do. But you know what he did? When he gave his heart to Jesus Christ, he moved forward. He never looked back. And he boarded the freighter. January 10, 1956, across to the Pacific. And he arrived in Manila, February 9, 1956. And when he got over there, the director of Wycliffe, Richard Pittman, said to him, Dick would like you to go work with the Isnag people. That's us, I'm an Isnag. And Dick started asking questions where the Isnags were located. They told him we were located way up in the northern jungles of the Philippines. And they told him that he had to go as far as he could by bus to the northern coast. And when he got to the end of the road, he had to go on a ferry boat to the next river. And when he got to that river, he had to paddle his canoe going upstream on the Abalog River. When he got to the end of the canoe ride, he had to hike another eight hours. Then he'll be in the heart of the Isnag territory. And that's what he did. March 1956, he went by bus, by canoe, by hiking. A week and a half later, he landed in a little tiny village called Dibagat. Well, if you look at the map of the Philippines, you look for the word Dibagat, it's nowhere to be found. And it's not even a speck of dust, but it's tucked away up in the northern jungles of the Philippines. And I have a GPS position to prove it's really there. And if you were the Isnag people, all of a sudden this guy walks in your village, six foot two, white, pale, clumsy at that. What would you want to do with him? Would you want to eat him? Oh yeah, we do, we love white people, they taste like chicken. Of course, we were scared. We didn't know what to do. I mean, what on earth is this guy doing here? We started asking him the questions the best way we knew how. He didn't speak our language. And we said to him, why are you here? And he said, I'd come to learn your language. What for? He said, I'd come to learn your language. And then we found out he was American. We knew about you Americans because you're the most powerful people on earth. General MacArthur on Second World War in there, he said, I shall return, and the Filipino people were liberated from Second World War. So we knew about you, the most powerful people on earth. But what on earth is this guy doing in the village of Dibagat where it's subsistent living? Why would you leave your home, your country, to come and live like us, 
because day in and day out you work to survive and survive to live. But we couldn't understand why would he come to live like us. So we continued asking him the question and we said, why are you really here? And he said, I've come to learn your language and give you God's word in your heart language. And we said to him, who is your God? He said, he's the God of heaven and earth. He created you, Isnak. He created the whole world. And we said to him, is he powerful? He says, yeah, he's powerful. Is he more powerful than our ancestors, the headhunters? He says, yeah, he's more powerful. Is he more powerful than the spirits that have controlled our lives from the beginning of time? He said, yeah, he's more powerful. We wanted to know more about his God because we were sick and tired of sacrificing to the spirit world. But we didn't know how to get out of it. You walk the trail, you've got to listen to the omen bird as it comes from left or right so that you wouldn't get sick if you start your rice field. But we were sick and tired of living that way. So we wanted to know more about his God. So we started teaching him our language. And he started looking into our mouths. We didn't have a written alphabet. And he started reaching out to us and learning more and more of our language. We started feeding him some of our exotic food. You eat some exotic food where I come from, you know, from grubs to beetles to dog meat. In fact, I have 101 ways to walk your dog. You know what a walk is, you know, we walk the dog that way there. And they all taste like chicken. And did you know that you could also eat beetles live? You gotta be careful if you eat them live, you gotta take the legs off before you pop them in your mouth. If you don't, they'll curl back out. And if you wanna be a good missionary, you gotta learn the song that says, where he leads me, I will follow. What he feeds me, I will swallow. Sometimes the most disgusting thing to do is swallow the food you're not familiar with. I love your food in this country, but I hate cottage cheese. It's the most disgusting food there is in the world. You know, sometimes people become fancy with cottage cheese. They put it in a china bowl and they put cherry on top. You know what that cherry is for? That's your camouflage and movement. It actually moves. <laughs> and so we started teaching this guy our language in there. And then my parents told me that I was old enough to go to first grade. But the problem was with my father, he didn't know when I was born. And I said to him, Dad, you don't even know when I was born. He said, I do too. You were born when you had a rice field on top of that mountain. I said, yeah, but I'm not seven. He said, you are seven. Reach across your head, touch your ears. I went like this. And I went across and I, sure enough, I could touch my ear. He said, see, you're seven. Go to school. So I had to go to school. And I climbed up that mountain up to the next valley. And then I went to this classroom. And they were not teaching in the vernacular. They were teaching in Tagalog, Ilocano, and English. And I hated school. So I skipped school for three months and flunked out of first grade. But this missionary was learning our language, and he continued learning our language, wrote our alphabet, and produced some books in the language. And it was awesome to go back to start first grade all over again, because he had books available in our language in there. He wrote some primers, wrote our alphabet, and then gave the books to the teachers, and the teachers started teaching in a language. And so I loved school after that. So we used to bring in all kinds of exotic food and fruit to this missionary. And then one day he was sitting and, and telling us how powerful his God was. That his God has his son. Jesus is his name. He came down to earth from heaven and nailed to a cross. And then we looked at each other and we said, we thought you, God, is powerful. We thought he's more powerful than the headhunters, more powerful than the spirits. But what kind of a God is it that could not even protect his only son from being nailed on a cross? Why should we believe in a powerless God like that? We wanted a God who could protect us so that when we walk the trail, we would not have to be scared of the spirit world. But he is your God so powerless. We can believe in a powerless God like that. And we questioned everything in there. But he continued working in our language. And you know, one day he started Bible translation work, and I'll never forget this book. This is the Gospel of Mark in my heart language in there. He gave me a copy of this book, and he came back home to the U.S. on furlough. And I'll never forget my first time to spend Christmas Day, 1963, as I took this Gospel of Mark down below the village of Dibagat, reading it for the very first time, the Word of God in this night. I was sitting on top of that big rock rock by the river bank, by the rapids, reading, not the Christmas story because it was Christmas, but reading about the Easter story, chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16 of this Gospel of Mark. And I started reading it, and all of a sudden, God removed the veil out of my eyes, and for the very first time, I could understand, I could visualize everything that was written in there. And one of the things that I remember was in chapter 13, Jesus and his disciples come out of this temple, 
And one of the disciples made a comment. He said, Master, look at the temple. Look at the rocks. Look at the homes. And this disciple was excited about what he was seeing on the outside. And the master said to him, you know, one of these days, not one of these rocks are going to be laid up on top of each other. It's just going to be dirt and rubble. And to me, it's a reminder for all the things that we own in this world. The material things that we own are just dirt and rubble. One day, they're just going to be gone. But the eternal things that we do for Jesus Christ, those are the things that last forever. That's why we do what we do in Bible translation work to make sure that the Word of God is given to people in the heart language in there. We invest for the future because we know it's all eternal. I continued reading in there and I come to the, to the picture of the Last Supper. You know, my picture of the Last Supper was you eat inside a hut and there you sit in a circle and there you squat on the floor, you eat with your fingers. That's my picture of the Last Supper. It's not like the picture we hang on the wall. You know, the picture we hang on the wall, you know what Jesus says on the picture. He says, hey guys, come on this side of the table if you want your picture to be taken. But I continued reading, and all of a sudden there was something in there that I couldn't understand. And I was reading my Bible here, my Gospel of Mark, as fast as I could. And pretty soon there was something that was happening in there that I couldn't understand. And reading it more, you know, pretty soon Jesus and his disciples were taken out of the, the garden in there where they were praying. And pretty soon they were before Pilate, and pretty soon Pilate scourged Jesus. And pretty soon they took him before the soldiers. And pretty soon the soldiers were making a crown of thorn and they forced it on his head in agony and pain. They beat him up some more and caned him. And I understood the agony of thorns because in my village we have thorns all along. When they prick your skin, it's an excruciating pain. It hurts. And then they forced him to carry a wooden cross up the hill and they started nailing his hands and his feet. And there was a breaking point deep in my heart. I hated God to the guts. Why should I believe in you? I shook my fist across the river and shouted on top of my voice, I hate you, God, for who you are because you couldn't protect your only son. Why should I believe in a powerless God? I wanted a God who could protect me from the spirit world, but here you are so powerless. Why should I believe in you? In this Gospel of Mark, I threw it down to the rocks with all my strength and I shook my fist some more and I said, in hatred to God, ranting at him, I said, I'll never believe in a powerless God like you. And I left my gospel down to the rocks and I started walking back to the village. And as I started walking towards the village in there, there was something that happened right there then. I said, God, the God of heaven and earth, reached into my heart and squeezed it and said, Nard, I did that for you. I love you that much. And for the very first time, I understood what grace was all about. There was no other argument. What else could I say? The God of heaven and earth said he loved me very much because he gave his only son to me. And I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. I became new. That's what the Bible says. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, everything becomes new. Man, I was new. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Are you new today? You know Jesus in a personal way. Man, I went back and picked up my Gospel of Mark. And I said, let me see. I sat back on top of that rock. Let me see the end of the story. And I continued reading in there. And I found out the power of the resurrection. Jesus was nailed on the cross and he died. And they buried him in a tomb. And the third day he rose again from the grave. I said, nobody in the Bagat, nobody among the Isnaks has ever risen from the grave. Yet Jesus had risen from the grave. That's why I love to listen to Don Francisco when he sings the song, he's alive, he's alive, I've been forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide, he's alive. And you know Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. And from there, I sat back on top of the rock and I said, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my life. But I want to go to school. I wanted to go to school so bad. I finished first grade up to sixth grade. And after that, you work in the rice fields up in the slopes of the mountains in there. But I wanted to go to high school. But I have to pay for an education. But there was no way for me to go to school. My parents were subsistent farmers. I didn't know what money looked like until I was about 15. So I just left it to God. I said, if you're God, you can provide money for me. Meanwhile, missionary Dick Rowe comes back to the village in there, January 1964. And I told him I met Jesus. You know, the joy of sharing the gospel to people in there is when people come to know who Jesus is really is. To Dick Rowe, it was an overflowing joy, and he was excited about me coming to know Christ. He said, man, I've been praying for you that you would come to know him. And then he said, I got to go down to Mindanao for the next four years. I didn't know where Mindanao is. My worldview was enclosed right in the village of Dibagat. 
and I didn't know what Mindanao was all about, but he said that he was going to be going there for the next four years. And then he said the sweetest music to my ear. He said, how would you like to go down with me to Mindanao? I'll help you go to school if you help me with the language. And then I knew God is real. And then he said something crazy. He said, but we need to build an airstrip. I said, what's an airstrip? He said, we're airplane lands. I said, what's an airplane? Airstrip, airplane, what's this? You know, this missionary was talking about something that I didn't know. And we believed him because he knew more than we did. So we went across the river of Dibagat in there and we found a spot in there and we built an airstrip. 600 feet long, 60 feet wide. In March 1964, this beautiful little hillier career comes and circles over the village and lands on a newly built airstrip. And I was in awe. I looked at this airplane. I said, wow, this is awesome, you know. And right on the cowling of that airplane, I could read a little bit of English. It says, the spirit of Pontiac. Well, it was a gift by the First Baptist Church of Pontiac, Michigan to Wycliffe in 1961. It landed in my village for the very first time, March 1964. And I was in awe. And I could still remember the pilot, Wayne Ashleyman. He fastened my seatbelt in the backseat of the Helio Courier. He put the missionary next to me, and he put a big basket up front. And I was all smiles, looking to the side. And then I could see my parents, my brothers and sisters, and all my friends looking on the side somewhere, crying for the first time, because I was leaving home for the very first time. And the engine roared, it was still okay. And it was all still smiles. And pretty soon the engine revved up some more. And pretty soon it was moving down this undulating air strip and we were airborne. And I thought for sure I was gone. I screamed for dear life. I grabbed hold of Dick Rose's leg. I said, oh no, I'm going to die. Surely God is not going to make me die this way here. This is terrifying, a terrifying moment in my life. As this airplane got airborne in there and I was screaming for dear life. And we landed 55 minutes later to Bagabag, Nuevo Vizcaya, the northern base of Wycliffe. And I made a conclusion at that, that flying was really for the birds. That if God wanted people to fly, he would have given them wings. I didn't want to have anything to do with flying. And then I had to learn four languages. I had to learn Locano, Tagalog, Cebuano, and English. And when I was a junior in high school, a missionary pilot with Wycliffe Bible translators, by the name of Bill Foster, challenged me into becoming a missionary pilot. And he said to me, Nard, one of these says we might not be welcome in your country. You've got to go learn to do what I'm doing. I said to him, I said, we called all the missionaries, aunts and uncles, and I said, Uncle Bill, me, become a pilot? I was born in the jungles, northern Philippines, in there with a machete in my hand. There is no way for me to learn to fly because that's too sophisticated for me. But you know what I found out? 28 years of flying. It really doesn't matter whether you're born in a hut born in a mansion or born in a stable. If you give your heart, your life to Jesus Christ, he makes all things possible. And he can use any one of you and any one of us for his kingdom, for his glory. And you know, I took that challenge. God opened wide the doors to come to this country. I went to Laterno College in Longview, Texas. And one of the things that left the Philippines in 1971, and then when I landed in Longview, Texas, 130 miles east of Dallas, I thought I spoke pretty good English until I landed there. I couldn't understand the language, you know, in Longview, Texas. Y'all come now. You hear? I mean, what are they talking about? Then I got in the classroom to learn aviation lingo, and they were talking about pistons, connecting rods, cylinders, wrist pins, and on and on. And I said, God, what on earth are you doing? This got to be a big mistake. This is not my forte, Lord. My forte is in the jungles. You give me a machete, drop me off there, and I could survive for months. But this is nuts. Am I supposed to learn this? And you know, when God calls us and reach into our heart, he tells us, hey, fasten your seatbelt. We'll, we'll do it together. And that's what exactly what we did. I fastened my seatbelt in there as if God said, hey, we're together. And it was just exciting. So I finished the Laterno. God opened wide the doors, Moody Bible Institute. And I could still remember to this day going into the business office in our Laterno and asking how much money I owed them. And I knew I owed them big, big time. But you know, the business office in there says you don't owe anything. Somebody paid your bill. And to this day, I don't know who paid my bill. And I could still remember going on to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. And I was standing in line, going through the registration line and putting my hands in my pocket. And I could still remember when I got to the table, I was supposed to give $650 
the registration day and all I had was $50 in my pocket. And I didn't know what to do. And I was pinching my $50 in there and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, would you please multiply my $50 into $650 because I didn't know where to get the money. And I was pinching it as hard as I could and waiting for that miracle. And I got to the table, my fingers were just as flat as they could be with a $50. And I said, now what am I going to do? And this lady looked up to me and says, your name is Nard Pogayo? I said, yes, ma'am, it's not Pogayo, it's Pogia. If you can say Pogia, just call me Smith. And she says, oh, Mr. Smith, by the way, there's a check here for you, $650. And I said, wow. You know, when God sends us out, he orchestrates everything in there. He put people in a strategic place just for us so that there's no excuse that we don't do anything for God. When God picks us up, he says, I will provide everything and everything that you need according to my riches and glory. So there's really no excuse not to do anything for God. And I went on and got down to uh, Tennessee for flight training in Elizabethton, Tennessee. And from there, it wasn't 650 this time, it was $1,200. But I knew God was going to provide that money because He's the God of heaven and earth. And so I continued flying, and then a week before I was supposed to have $1,200 in there, a stranger from Brewer, Maine calls on the phone. He said, Nard, this is Don Higgins. You don't know who I am, but how much money do you need? I said, boy, these Americans, they come straight to the point. And I was embarrassed a little bit. And I said, I'm, 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 I'm supposed to have uh, to, 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 to $1,200 by next week. Just don't worry about it. I'll send you a check. And you know, he sent me the check and paid for my pilot training because God placed him again in a strategic place just for me. And then graduated in 1975. I moved up to Michigan, worked for a year or so. I met my wife, Sandy, in Waxo in 1972. And she chased me for four and a half years until I caught her. And we got married. She put up with me for 29 years. And then we joined Wycliffe Bible Translators in 1977. And our first assignment to the Philippines was 1979. And the best part of going to the Philippines is this book. This is the New Testament in Isnag, my heart language. And June 24, 1982 was the best part of my flying career. This June 24, 1982, I was packing the first 500 copies of this book, the New Testament in Isnag. And as I was packing them, I was asking the question, Lord, what if? What if Dick Rose said, no way, God, forget about going. I'm not going to go. I'll just teach at university, whatever it takes, you know. What if he said no? What if his supporters said to him, no, we don't want to support missionaries. We could send them a used tea bags, but no, we don't want to help them at all. But, you know, God touched every one of them. He touched Jack Wordson so that he preached the right words. And Dick Rowe responded. His supporters said, we will be behind you. And they gave him money to go. And Dick said, I will give my heart to you, God. And he gave his heart to him. Because God knew that Nard Pugya was sitting up in the northern jungles needing to read the word of God and that he would return full circle to deliver this Bible to the Isna people. I loaded them in the Hillier Courier that was flying to the Bagat and then I fastened my wife's seat belt and Stephen who was just two years old. And we took off on a clear day and we got closer to the Bagat and I could see the winding Abulog River coming up to the Bagat in there and I said, Lord, you could have drowned Dikro and all his partners. As they traveled by canoe, 25 years they did the Bible in my language. You could have wiped them out and Wycliffe would have never have sent anybody else to go. But no, you protected them because you knew June 24, 1982 was made for Nard Pugia. I got on top of the airstrip and I looked down below and it looked pretty good in there. And 45 minutes hike to the next valley. I usually like to go fly in there. It's where I was born. Half a minute later, I was circling over the little tiny village of Bayuho, and down below I could see coconuts after coconuts after coconuts. Underneath the coconut groves, I, three, see, I see three little tiny huts. And the third hut on the right, I said, Lord, that's where you formed me in secret. You plucked me out of there to become yours. How awesome I thought that you, the God of heaven and earth, can actually pinpoint anywhere in the world to get any one of us. And he can pinpoint to any one of you and say, hey, I want you hard to give it to me. I'll make wonders. That's what God wants us to do. And then I lined up for that approach. I couldn't miss 600 feet, and I touched down within 200 feet. That helio courier stopped. I taxied to the end. I turned around. I shut down. I got out. 
My wife Sandy got out, Stephen got out. I went to the back seat of the Helio Courier and I took the first box out of the airplane. I placed it on the ground and I went back for the second box. And then I turned around and I looked in there and the first box was gone being carried by a woman. She placed it on top of her head, moving to the side. I looked and it was my older sister, Emma. And I hollered at her and I said, Manang, what are you, you know what you're carrying? She said, adding, it's just a box. I gotta move it out of the way. And I said to her, hey Manang, those are New Testaments in our language. And at that moment, I wished I had a camera to capture that moment because she smiled big and she moved her leg up a little bit and then she lifted that box up with all her strength and literally brought it down and literally hugged it with all her strength. And she said, are you serious? I'm gonna have a copy of my very own New Testament in our language. And deep inside my heart, it was about ready to burst. And I thought back of Dick Roy, I said, oh God, what if Dick said no? And for the very first time, just imagine the feeling of reading for the very first time the Word of God in your own heart language, where it penetrates deep to the very core of your being, where it says, Man, that's a penetrating power of the Word of God, John 3.16. For God to love the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but of eternal life. Man, that's power. That's why we do what we do in Bible translation work. So that the ends of the year is the 2,529 languages left to do. We'll also have the chance for themselves to read the Word of God in their own heart language. And you know God can use any one of you today because there's a world out there that needs Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he said, Therefore, beloved brethren, he said, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. God bless you. Thank you. I am just one of the ripple effects of Bible translation work. In Revelation 5, 9, we read that Jesus purchased man for God from every tribe, language, and nation. The work of Bible translation is proceeding in the following languages. Soon people in these language groups will have the life-transforming Word of God in their own heart language.
Work has yet to begin in the following languages. As far as we can tell, for these groups, the voice of God is silent. We would love for you to be a part of giving God's word to these people. 